Hello and welcome to another InventRight webinar. We got an amazing one for you tonight. My name is Andrew Krause. I co-founded InventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago, and we've been coaching and mentoring inventors ever since. We have students in 65 countries over that time. I'm over there on the left in the dark suit. Stephen's to the left of me with the glasses, the very handsome, handsome gentleman. Um, sure. Tonight, we have somebody that Stephen knows. His name is Dave Small. And the way I, I'll just do a brief explanation of who he is. He's basically, um, he should be your hero. He, he is a professional inventor and licensor of products. He is like the Iron Man of licensing and inventing toy products. That's the way I would explain him, explain you to him. But Stephen has known him for, how long have you known David, Stephen? Well, it's been, a, first of all, thank you, Andrew. It's been a long time. Um, back in the mid 80s, I think, uh, David Small hired me. It was basically my first job. I don't, I didn't tell him at the time, but I think he knew it. Did you uh, lie on your resume? Yes, of course I did. And <laughs> okay. he, um, you know, he, he bought it and hired me. So yeah, this is a very special webinar tonight, everybody. <laughs> but who, who is he? Why do we have him on the night, Stephen? Why, why do you feel well, like our audience would gain from listening to, to yeah, let me Let me introduce Dave, David. Um, everybody that's listening tonight, this is a great honor for me because I was a, a, a very inexperienced uh, inventor back in the 80s. And my very first job was at the startup World's Wonder. And I had read an article in the Fremont paper where this uh, startup called World's Wonder was going to launch the first ever talking teddy bear. And the photograph, it, it was a prototype and I didn't think it looked very good. And at the time I was designing plush for another company and I thought, I'm just gonna go down there on a Monday and knock on the door and tell these guys they need to hire me. And they did. And I was a little surprised and I ended up working with probably one of the smartest guys I've ever met and probably I think David still is and you'll after tonight you'll know why. And David hired me and changed my life, basically. So, David Small, I cannot thank you enough. How's that? Well, you're welcome, Steve. So Mr. you did show up with a fairly low skill set for what you were hired to do. But within a very short period of time, you became proficient at doing that job. So it was a good hire. Well, thank you. And I, I know I was probably a, a management problem, but you put up with me. And you gave me the opportunity to shine. So it kind of worked out. So hey, listen, there were there's a lot of management problems in a startup. There's a you know, we hired in our group, if you recall, we hired over a hundred people in an extremely short period of time. And you throw that many people together, you weren't the worst management problem that I had. <laughs> Let me tell you that. There you go, Andrew. You heard it. I've got it recorded. <laughs> um I won't come. So everyone tonight, this is a this is um, a very special webinar on on many levels, because I left the toy industry and kind of played a little bit, but uh, David stayed. And not only did he stay in this industry, he's excelled at this industry. In fact, so much. Um, now you're going to hear this, and I've heard this from multiple people at multiple companies that. Um, David Small and Paul Rago are probably the number one toy inventors in the world today. David, is that true? Well, you know, the, we do have competition out there, but we have been very successful for 30 years doing this job. So, you know, we're like the old geezers, <laughs> you know, so people, you know, we get some respect just for that, but uh, we have been very lucky in our 30 years. And we've done so, some amazing products. So David, you've stayed in it since the mid '80s. Um, there's a picture of you and, and Paul Rago. Um, how many, how many um, toy ideas have you licensed? Ballpark. You know, Steve, I I, I really can't say because I've never really counted them up. Uh, we have on our website, you know, we have over a hundred, and, and I said that's so old that that number is way off. 
uh, but I did do a quick calculation based on, you know, X number per year. Then I came up with the 500 number, which is probably reasonably accurate, but I'm not sure that that really gives the true scope of what Shoot the Moon has been able to accomplish in that period of time, because a product can turn into a line and so that and we, we're paid royalty on basically the whole line. So one, one licensed product can turn into 15, five, 10, 20 products. Okay. So it's, it's really hard to go back and, and fill all that in. And I've never felt the need to do that. I mean, you could go to our website and look, we, we don't really keep it up that much. Um, but you know, it has it has the bulk of our big uh, products on there for the okay. last thirty years. So, what about the retail sales number, David? I saw that. I think I've seen it someplace. It's in the billions, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's definitely in the billions. It's probably, you know, it's somewhere around two billion. Gee whiz. Okay, um, Andrew, let's go to the next slide real quick. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, David, this picture to the left, um, it looks like you're shooting a commercial. To, what is about? What is this photo of? Yeah, so I went to school at uh, DeVry Institute to get a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. And that's a small school. It's, it's re actually a, a very good school, and it's, it's rather hard to get through. And I was, um, they contacted me maybe 10 years later. Well, it wasn't even that long. I graduated in 77 and they contacted me in 85, maybe 86. That looks like 86 based on what I see around me. Uh, and they wanted to do a commercial. And so I, I wasn't really that interested in doing a commercial. You know me, Steve, I'm pretty, I'm pretty I stay under the radar quite a bit. And so I agreed to do it if they gave me a couple of scholarships that I could designate. I didn't okay. take payment or anything. I took these two scholarships and I was able to uh, give scholarships to two deserving kids. And they ran that commercial for probably five years. <laughs> and I was like, wow, amazing. Well, well, David, let's, you know, the other pictures here, let's go to the far right for just a minute. Um, and the reason why they ran that commercial, Teddy Ruxpin was exploding, is that correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. The world's a wonder, you know, we shipped a hundred million dollars worth of product and we started really the company, we started best efforts to get this thing done in February. By the end of the year, we had shipped a hundred million dollars worth of product. That was the fastest growing company in the history of the world at that time. Wow. And not only Teddy Ruxman was a big hit, the next big splash was laser tag, isn't that correct? So Teddy Ruxman was a number one toy in 1985. It's really hard to get to a number one toy. Uh, very, you know, there's a lot of product out there to get number one on everybody's listing. And that's for retail sales. We track it in wholesale sales, but it doesn't matter, it equates to retail. Um, that was a, it's a big deal to come out of the gate for a new company and get a number one. The next year we followed that up with laser tag and it then ran up to laser tag being one and Teddy Ruxpin being two. So we were like, wow, this is amazing. So two years in a row, that was a lot of work. You were there doing the complete series of uh, development of laser tag. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, you came in somewhere in the, middle, probably closer to the end of the development of Teddy Rucks, but more yep. in the marketing campaign and so forth. But that was a, that was amazing uh, to do those two products, just like that. Yeah, I think when I came in, I think I was an employee number 20. And um, it was the trailer. And then it kind of just exploded after that. I remember quite um, quickly. But um, I want to show this next slide, David. I have a little surprise for you. Yeah. Okay, let's show this next slide. Oh, my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never seen the basketball slide. <laughs> now, here's the question, David. Where was that taken, that uh, slide 
Looks like it's slide number one. Oh yeah, slide number one was in the parking lot. And where though? Do you remember where? Well, you know, we had a basketball court that we put in the parking lot. We used yep. to move that into the warehouse and out of the warehouse, if you recall. Okay. Oh my God, is that Nick? Yep. That's Steve right there, running after the ball. It's not, a, it's not a great flattering picture, but I thought it would show it anyway because I know Dave loves basketball and so do I. Yeah. But, but number two, picture number two, what's going on there? Well, we're testing, uh, we're testing laser tag right there. And boy, I can't even tell who's in the picture. Can you? Uh, I thought it was. No, I don't know. You know, it, it had to be your engineers, right? It had oh, to be your no team. It, it's my engineers. It's right outside the building. In fact, that is, that's right outside uh, the far end where the president's office was at the time. So, you know, just based on what their profiles kind of look like, it seems to be. Well, I don't want to speculate, and I don't want to necessarily start naming a bunch of people's names out there. But you know, yeah, it's the engineering team right there. Okay. Sure. What about what about uh, the picture number three? Where is that, Dave? Picture number three. Okay, that's got to be. That looks like Hong Kong. Yes, it is. And that looks like Hong Kong, and that looks like first shot models being tested. Yeah. What about number four? That number four, that's a lot of Worlds of Wonder product, but other people's products. So that's got to be at a factory. Yes, it is. And of course, number five, they're boxing Teddy. Yeah, that is at, that is at a factory that is packing out. That looks like first year, Teddy Ruxpin. Yep, and then number six, that was where? Sourcing International, Hong Kong. That was in Sim South Shui Center. Um, I don't know, what was that on the 11th floor, Steve? That's, yes, spent a lot of time there. Yes, we did. Thought I'd take you down memory lane, Dave. That is memory lane right there, buddy. All right, okay, hey, next slide, please. Let me ask you this, what factory was that? You know, I don't remember. Where'd you get it? I just had, I kept all these photographs. Well, cool. I kept tons of them. And I thought, uh, I know you haven't seen uh, many of these. So Dave, your partner is Paul Rago. Can we talk a little bit about Paul real quick? Because Paul was a, a big part of Worlds of Wonder, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, so me and Paul are partners. And we're partners. It's a fantastic story about how we became partners. But we met we met at Worlds of Wonder. Paul was hired before I was. I had a job at the time that I had to get out of. And I, I told this ragtag group of guys that came to my house to show me this teddy bear that there is not a prayer that I'm leaving my director of engineering job that I had just been promoted to at a startup high tech company in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, they said, well, listen, we're going to start a toy company and we're going to do it with this bear. And it was this awful prototype that we used to call Biafra bear. I know you remember that. Yep. And uh, they they talked to me, they talked to me about it a little bit. They probably weren't there for more than a half an hour. We were catching up on old times from Atari, which is where we all met. And uh, they said, well, we're going to leave it here and we'll come back tomorrow and get you signed up. I said, you can leave it here, but you know, I'm not quitting my job. And so. I had two kids at the time. These two kids, you know, were young and they left and I, we started playing with the bear and they were mesmerized, just mesmerized. So I took that bear down the, to my next door neighbor first because there was a young boy there and played it for him with his parents and they were just huddled around it and he was mesmerized and they were too. And I went to like three other houses on the street that had kids in them and everything was, it was so mesmerizing that the next day, in the morning, I went into my office and had to walk in and tell the president of this company, because they had just promoted me to director of engineering, that I was leaving to go to a toy company. And they were like aghast. And, oh, there was a terrible meeting. But anyway, so I got out two weeks later, 
And by then there were trailers in a parking lot of a building that was still being built. Mm -hmm. And there was three trailers. One of them had a sign on it that said engineering. One of them, just a paper sign stuck on the outside of the building. Another one said uh, marketing and finance and another one said administration, right? There were these three trailers. I walk into the engineering trailer, figuring, okay, it's just an empty trailer. There's nothing in it. So I'm like, huh. I mean, it's not, there's nothing in it, not even a telephone. And so I walk next door to the next trailer and there's this one guy sitting there and it was Paul. And I said, who are you? And he says, who are you? So I said, I'm David Small. I'm head of engineering. And he says, I'm Paul Rago. I'm head of marketing. And, and I said, so um, where's everybody? Oh, Don's out trying to get money and Larry's out over at this meeting, et cetera. You know, so no one was there, just me and Paul. So I said, okay, um, like, uh, well, where, how, do we, how do I do a PO? I got to get some equipment. And he's like, we have no systems. I said, well, how do I buy anything? Use your own credit card. <laughs> okay. So within a couple of days, I had to buy a lab bench, some supplies. I mean, I had nothing, right? So I buy all this stuff and go into work every day in this trailer. But I was probably only there for two weeks. And then I was in Hong Kong and mm -hmm. Southern California at Alchemy. So that's how we met. Now, Paul and I were responsible for product, right? I was engineering. Uh, product development and Paul was marketing and also product development. So it was kind of split in this uh, organization. Classically, it was just, uh, we called it marketing and engineering. There was no real product development at the company. So we developed all these really great products. And the short story goes about two and a half years after developing all these great products, the company goes bankrupt in 1987 with the recession. And a bunch of reasons which I won't go into. The only people that stayed, the only executives that were asked to stay were me and Paul because we made the product and the product was great. The rest of the company obviously failed in their mission. I was really young at the time. I started at that job at 29. So all I, want, all I was doing was making product, not necessarily looking after the finances of the company, but we failed. And the turnaround team came in. We were there for another year and a half or so and finally, you know, I couldn't take it anymore, uh, so I, I I quit as an executive, and Paul stayed around for a while. But we made some some such great product. I went off to Galoob Toys, and uh, Paul went and did another venture with the same guy that started Worlds of Wonder for a short period of time. And Galoob ran into a management shuffle while I was there. I mean, this, the president was ousted, and so. In that shuffle, uh, it was a difficult time, but I happened to break my knee and I broke my patellar tendon. So I was out right when the shuffle happened. And the company called me and said, We're you're you're fired because you can't com you can't com complete your responsibilities at the company and we're short of everybody now, so we're letting you go. So I said, You can't let me go. I have a contract. So we we negotiated like 20 minutes before I went into surgery, we negotiated what my deal would be to leave. So I got a surgery, my family was there, they all left, I got my, I got my morphine pump that I could press whenever I needed. And I, I wake up one time and it's Paul Rago sitting in a chair. And I'm, I wake up groggy, like, what are you doing? And he said, okay, uh, me and you, we're gonna start that uh, toy inventing company we talked about years ago, because you don't have a job and my job sucks right now. So are you in? I'm like groggy and everything. I'm like, yeah, sure. Right? I mean, that's basically all I could say. I was literally two hours out of surgery, mm. trying to get some rest. So I get released a couple of days later. I'm sleeping in my bed at home. I wake up, it's Paul Rego at the foot of my bed with his notepad. You know Paul. And he says, okay, I got a bunch of ideas we're gonna work on. He rattles off like, Paul has a million ideas. He's like the, the best idea man in the business. And then he says, Where, what are your ideas? And I'm like, what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm recuperating. I got a broken knee. I'm in a cast. I'm in traction. In my, what are you talking about? So he says, I know you have ideas. We talked about them. Let's, uh, I need to write them down so we can uh, get going here. <laughs> so I, I give him a bunch of ideas. 
And it, so we just sort of moved into being mm -hmm. two just, just like that. It just, it just happened. I had a broken leg and okay. we developed our three big products that kicked us off. And that was TV Teddy and a video camera and a, I mean, a video camera for kids that was supposed to be under $100. It was very difficult. And Can you a, go to the next slide for me, please, real quick? And so because that's how you hit the ground running pretty quick, didn't you? Mm, very quickly. Very because quickly. it wasn't long. I know TV Teddy, um, but just to kind of move it along, you, you started that partnership started at Worlds of Wonder, but it seemed to really grow once you moved into that office. And I think it's in Pleasant and Shoot the Moon because you started to have hits, didn't you? I started to have what? Major hits like oh, Elmo yeah. Live and oh, yeah. some of the yeah. other ones. I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is, how do you go from two guys that work together, decide you're going to build a company, and next thing you know, you're designing toys? Was it, uh, and you're doing independently now. Yeah. And I guess what I'm wondering is, how long did it take for you guys to, to drive some revenue to your new company? So, um, as you know, Toy Fair is in February, right? We started our company in February, but it was really uh, November. We formally formed it in February, but it was really November when I broke my knee. And so from November to February, we were working on ideas and concept drawings, and I was working on TV Teddy out by the pool, <laughs> you know? really making TV Teddy out by the pool. And so we had to go to Toy Fair. And at that first Toy Fair, we did about four deals, which brought money into the company because you can get, you can get money with a deal right off the bat. If you, if you negotiate a deal, everybody does a handshake. You can get the deal knocked out pretty quickly. So we probably brought in, oh, um, 100,000, right? And that was back in dinosaur days. So that was a lot of money. And, uh, and then we very quickly, we did those three products that I was talking about um, and we went and showed them to Bandai. And Bandai did a deal with us instantly to develop these products. It was just me and Paul, I have no staff. And while I'm, I'm capable of developing products on my own, they want three done in a short period of time so that they could show them. And these were highly complex items. So. We got a development deal with them and a royalty deal. They paid us to develop them and they paid us royalty when they came out on the market. So yeah, we, it, it all came together very quickly. And it came, it came together because we had a track record of hit makers. Yeah. Teddy Ruxpin, which wasn't our idea. That idea came from somebody else, but we had laser tag, which was our idea. So that's how we, got, that's how we pulled it on. We had a track so record. Davis? Let's talk about this for a minute because let's talk about that creative process for a minute. You know, I, I know Laser Tag was born from you and Paul at Worlds of Wonder. But what is that creative process? Because everybody wants to know it's one thing if you come up with one hit, okay, you know, the one hit wonder, okay. Number two, all right, you know, you hit it twice. But it seems like your career at Shoot the Moon with Paul Rego, you've repeatedly have come up with hit toys that have done very well. Can you kind of peel back that a little bit for us? How do you do that? What is that process? All right, I will, I'll peel that back a little bit. It's not, it's not really a, a great mystery or, any, mystery or anything. So like I said before, Paul is, a, is an unbelievable idea guy. And I have, and I'm pretty good at development, right? So we both do development and we both do ideas. My ideas tend to be the more complex things like this TV Teddy thing, and Paul's ideas tend to be more marketing driven and so forth, but we collaborate on everything we do inside this company. So we have two people that match very well together. Our personalities are rather different. How we, you know, the things that we are capable of doing are rather different. So. Uh, Together, we form a pair that is a team that is better than its individual parts. So that was important. And I think is, is really the heart of our success is that we can we fit together so well. I mean, Paul couldn't do 
can't do hardly anything technical, right? So to get, but but his ideas just will just keep coming and coming and coming. It's hard to keep up with. Um, so we put together a team of people like today. We're a inventing machine. And so what happens is it becomes a, it's a process. We know which products toy companies will tend to license. We know where they have, where there's opportunities at toy companies, things that they can't do, areas that they need to grow. We tend to target a spot that no one is in. So we like to bring really new opportunities to toy companies, something that's not on their radar because, you know, no one wants to, license a toy from an inventor. They would rather do it on their own. So mm -hmm. they don't have to pay the royalty. So you have to you know, target with some precision what you're gonna show them. So we know the toy industry well, we know what sells, we know what the price points are. Um, so we can design something that fits in the aisle at retail and will fit within the portfolio of Mattel or Hasbro, Spin Master, Moose, you name it. Right, and so we try to tailor our ideas to be okay. unique and extremely creative, and and at the right price point, and with the ability for the client to be able to finish doing it after we give them a really good prototype. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you know where that sweet spot is, David? I mean. Do you, do you ask them, do they give you a target to hit? Do you look at their product line? Do you, do you read the magazines? Do you know the trends? How do you know? All right, so they, the toy companies give the major invent, toy inventors a wish list on things to work on. Okay. I tend to ignore the wish list because I say, look, the toy company has identified their spot. They're working on it really hard. They've asked the best inventors in the world to work on it. So me personally, I tend to ignore it somewhat because there's a lot of competition. So for a product like TV Teddy, which just happened to be on the screen, well, let's, we've talked enough about that. Let's talk about Elmo Live. Elmo was very successful by this time and had, had a major hit, and that was Tickle Me Elmo, wasn't that product know the guys who did it but major hit right and then they started doing these products that were one that did one thing so there was chicken dance elmo and there was you know a number of elmos like that that were all very successful and a new one every year so we decided to use our animatronics expertise and make a, the best elmo that's ever been done with multiple motors not with one motor we did that Elmo Live is a three motor animatronic and each one of those motors can do two things. So I know, Elmo's popular, I know that feature Elmo sell. I have to now come up with the best feature Elmo that they've ever seen. So hmm. we made one that has the head movement like it's a puppet. So we just analyze what Elmo does. Elmo's a puppet, you know, and it's driven by a hand, live. So we took that hand motion, made a mechanism that duplicated it, and then we did something extraordinary. We said, we'll let him sit down on a chair and we'll let him cross his legs and tell you a story and move his arms. So we, we made that prototype, brought it into, at the time, uh, Fisher Price, and put it on the table, deal was done that day. Just like that. So it's so a process, they, right? We, you're, we, Let's talk about your engineering background for just a minute. Yeah. Because um, back in your career, you're at a, weren't you um, working at Atari at one time? I was. Okay. So, but engineering is your thing, right? But how do you combine engineering with creativity? I mean, it seems like they're kind of two different things. Like, you know, well, engineers well, are kind of like kind of, I wouldn't say, you know, you, you know, you have a picture of an engineer, but. I know, and, and, I, and you and, and, and all your compatriots and even your wife would say, you are not an engineer, you don't act like it. And the only thing about you that's an engineer is you wear that pocket protector, right? <laughs> okay. And the engineers get a really bad rap in that there is tremendous creativity to make a circuit do a very precise and precision thing. Right? 
you don't necessarily get that from a catalog on how to do that. You've got to learn it. You've got to figure it out. I mean, you have to apply creativity and how you're going to get this circuit to do what you need it to do and then write code to do that. Engineers tend to be people that are not very outgoing and, you know, they're not the face of the company that anyone puts out, right? But they're very creative naturally. What I've been able to do is, is take that engineering talent and broaden it to just a global scope of product development. So learning, <laughs> I don't know, you weren't there, but the first time I went to Hong Kong, I described to a vendor that I needed fur for this teddy bear that we're building, right? And you know my personality, Steve, I'm very like, I need to get stuff done and we need to keep moving. And he says, fur. And I'm like, yeah, fur. And <laughs> And he says, really? Fur? I said, listen, I need fur. Can you just bring some fur samples tomorrow? <laughs> he, he went away. Really good friends with this guy to this day. He brought in real fur. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm not asking for, you know, cowhide fur. I mean, I want, you know, this stuff. And he says, well, number one, that's plush. It's not fur. <laughs> and here's what you want. You know, so, I was, you know, you learn. And so you learn, and he taught me how to do hand sewing and so forth. So, you know, when you're playing with things and manipulating them, okay. and you study the market that you're in, and the, the study of the market is like osmosis. You're in it long enough, you get it. I get it, right? And so that's kind of how okay. you bridge those two things. It's not for me. Like I wake up in the morning and say, I want to make this uh, Elmo that does these things. It's more like, I need an Elmo. Let's go figure out what the coolest Elmo is and let's analyze it in the real world for me, right? And so we make something like that. Right. We, made, we made this hit product called Fidget. It was a huge global success. And it was an animatronic, like we always done, but we, we decided to skin it in something other than plush. And we decided to make a big, vivid display instead of some little tiny lights that the toy companies typically use. And we decided that we know that girls like animatronic better than boys from history. So we made it a girl product, targeted to girls. And then we get it, put a design around it, targeted to girls. You see, so it ends up kind of being a process of building blocks that you know that you put together okay. in the mix. Dave, I have a question. How important it is to really understand the company you're going to submit the idea to? Like their mission statement, their product line, their price point, the materials they use. Do you know the companies you submit ideas? Do you know that frontwards and backwards of what they do? Oh, yeah, for sure. We know what they do. We know the history of what they buy. We know if they're risk takers. We know if they're line builders. We know if they're an item company, we know they're, you know, you know, we just know. But it's a little, it's a little unfair for us because we're in the middle of it. Everybody knows us. We know them. Mm -hmm. I could call anybody in a company and talk it as well and get a call back. Um, but yes, we, t when we come up with an idea, you know, we come up with on our, ourselves. We don't typically use the wish list of anybody. We come up with. I don't know, let's say 50 ideas a year so we can license 10 of them. And that's a fantastic hit rate. So I want all the, all the burgeoning inventors out there to know that you cannot be successful in this business if you have one idea and you try to drive that idea to some logical license end conclusion or, or go to manufacturing with it yourself. Because... You need a lot of ideas to become successful. Most toy products, most products in general fail. So mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to keep moving forward, keep coming up with new things, take them to the point, to a logical point where you can exploit it. So if that exploitation is going to be licensing, you take it to a point where you can get a client excited about it. What Shoot the Moon does is we don't go and ask a client, Hey, would you like this? Some people do that. And a client will say yes or no. Um, we, we put that prototype on the table and say, here it is. And okay. we somewhat target it for them. But the important lesson here is do not get stuck on one idea. 
All right. Because most things fail. So out of that 50 that you pitch, how many ideas per year actually come up to get down to the 50? Oh, well, oh, there's probably the kernels of maybe a hundred ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, and these ideas roll over, right? Because we can't do them all at the same time. And they get thrown out because time changes. Mm -hmm. And we're in a fashion industry, so fashion changes. And I know people think of fashion as clothing, but you know, a uh, toy company, toys come and go every year. So it's, it's like a fashion business. So we have these ideas that sort of roll over and then in any one year, we, we will take an idea and put it on the table. And then we, so we, let's say we select an idea to do a thing that wraps around your wrist that will animate. That idea, the general idea, is fortified and grown with the talented staff at Shoot the Moon. Tell the next slide, Andrew, because I think that's what David's talking about. Is this the one, David? Uh, yeah, that's the one, that's one right there. Yeah, that's a raffle in the middle. And that idea was to was to take something that you could carry with you, put it on your wrist, again, targeted to girls for that one. Um, but that, my my point here was that we have surrounded ourselves with a extraordinarily talented team at Shoot the Moon. So there's 14 people there. Every one of them is world class. Every one of them could be could probably be an inventor on their own if they were to be in individual inventors. Together we make up a group that you know it's, we have a world class product development and engineering team at was at uh, Shoot the Moon. Okay. Well, I'll stack it up to any any major toy company any day of the week. And that's how we can do so many cool things every year. It's not just me and Paul. Yeah, because what's amazing is that you license so many. But David, I want to talk about the price point for a minute, too. Um, how important is that, that when you presented a, a product that maybe you have an idea what it's going to cost the manufacturer and what the retail price is going to be? Well, listen, um, if you're going to be successful, you have to know your market. And this is why I tell people to invent in a space that you know. So if you're a contractor and you want to be creative and make stuff, invent stuff for the contracting business. Don't necessarily go into toys. I'm not saying you can't and I'm not saying you wouldn't be successful. But if you invent in a space that you know, you will be much more successful because you'll know how much would I be willing to pay for that in, and you'll know. Look, Black & Decker has their live cameras, and you know, if you're making the next coolest hammer in the world, you have to know what your competition is. So let's say a hammer typically costs $25 for a, a reasonable hammer. You can't come out with a hammer that costs $200 and expect all the carpenters to buy it because they're not going to buy it or the home or the people at home because they're not going to buy it. So you know you got to be somewhere in the space where it's typically, the, t the sales typically are. So price point for us is critical and we know the price point that we are targeting. So we know if we're trying to make a $14.99, animatronic that goes on your wrist we have limited resources we can use we can use maybe a pager motor a little speaker a couple of lights and sometimes even a, a three and a half cent led matters right and so we will target that price point of 14.99 which means that we've got to make it five times cheaper than that to manufacture right and so when we walk in and we say, this is $14.99, our clients know from Shoot the Moon that it's $14.99 retail and that they can make margin at that, at that number. So that, that gives you a big advantage maybe over other inventors just because of your knowledge about manufacturing? Oh yeah, I, I'm, I, I know it does. And, uh, okay. and it gives our clients confidence that what Shoot the Moon says they're gonna do, they're gonna do it and we're gonna deliver it and we're gonna deliver it at a price point that they can sell it at. Okay. Critical. Okay. Hey, um, David, how do you balance 
the creative side of this, which is really exciting and fun and problem solving and making magic with the business side of it? Well, the business, uh, is, the business is of rejection, the business is problems and, you know, pitching ideas and all that kind of great stuff. How do you balance both sides so you don't go crazy or lose your magic? You know, it's a good question, Steve. Um, you know, Paul and I run the company and we let everybody else um, have all the fun of making stuff and coming up with, you know, how to make stuff better. And um, the business side of it is difficult. We have to negotiate with our clients and they have a big legal staff and they have a big marketing team and everything else. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to go through constantly and you do it for every product. But, you know, we have to do it. It's part of business. And so you have to take care of business so that you have money coming in to be creative. So number one, you've got to make sure you've got revenue coming in. And now I have, this, I have this big staff of people that rely on the company being successful. So we can make all the great products that we want, but you've got to sell those products mm -hmm. and you've got to sell them at a royalty rate or if, if you were not a, a inventor like we are that, that gets royalty revenue, you have to sell them at a, a retail price point or a wholesale price point that makes money. And you have to do that. I mean, I, I have to get that done first. And so you try to become as, as efficient as possible at getting that stuff done. And you spend the rest of your time in creativity. So. I, 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 there's another thing that I believe in in business, and that is you can be as structured and as and as buttoned up as possible, but you you have to have something to sell. So, and you, you know, you gotta with with revenue that comes in or with hits, it covers a lot of sins that you might make being a small businessman or even being a big toy company. Big toy companies do extremely well when they have hits and their business practices are exposed when they don't have a big hit, mm -hmm. right? So you've got to take care of your business, but you still have to come up with really good ideas. I don't know how to per se balance that because it's like a daily thing. If Spin Master calls or if Moose Toys calls and they have an issue that they need they need to shoot the moon to deal with, whether it's business or product, you've got to deal with it. It's a client. Right, so you deal with it as best you can. Okay. Hey, Dave, one last question, then I want to open it up to, for people to ask questions. Um, have you loved this industry, and, and would you do anything different? Yeah, you know, I've been at it for 30 years now, Steve, so obviously I love uh, making product. I, I just, I just, I mean, I, it's, it's fantastic to, to go through the process three to six months from an idea to holding that thing in your hand. And then the, the best part is those meetings that happen when you go and show a product to a client and they freak out, right? And I, we've had, we've been lucky enough to have, I don't know, maybe 20 of these meetings where everyone is a Twitter from what we showed and we know we have the deal. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's just, it's, it's exhilarating, right? Mm -hmm. And we get that, and we do that all the time on a constant basis. And I try not to let it be sort of normal and every day and take it for granted because it's really cool to take something and be able to show it to clients, your friends, your family, and get them all jacked up about it and everybody's excited. And it's just fun. We get to do it so often. You know, we're not making the next audio amplifier. We're making the next toy that's gonna provide happiness and delight to people. So it's fun, and it's fun to do that. And uh, you know, I haven't left Steve, and you know, I've had many opportunities to do other things and I've stayed here. So that must work. Dave, with, looking back on your career, is there anything you would do different or anything you would tell someone else that's listening tonight? That I would do different. I don't have. I honestly have 
so few regrets in how we've done things. There, there've been times when I've pushed clients too hard and lost a deal, uh, but Shoot the Moon has a reputation for being, um, you know, we need what we need and we, we don't have to bend to the will of these big companies. And, you know, that's a very difficult thing to say out loud, but they, everybody knows it and that's our reputation. I mean, I would have done some projects differently, um, but I maybe would have, you know, done some business things differently, like bought the bought the building that we we're in earlier, things like that. But no, I mean, I don't okay. have any thoughts. David, thank you. Andrew, why don't you open up, see if we have questions. Yeah, I just want to say to David that my seven-year-old daughter has two of these three products, the Hatchimals and the Rapples. But she doesn't have the other one. I'm so sorry she didn't buy that other one. Put, put the other slide well, up. Little my pets, where we little my pet is a lot. There's maybe 40 products in that line. Wow. So you might not have that little puppy. But how old your daughter? Seven, going on oh, eight. She had, she had something that was in the little my pet line. Okay, she probably does. She has so many toys. And Hatchimals, <laughs> that was a global, that was a massive global phenomenon. Oh, yeah. We got We got wow. two of those. Yeah. And so that's probably, from a retail sales point of view, the biggest thing we've ever been involved with. That's a whole nother long story on how that happened that you have no time to get into now. But <laughs> that's a global phenomenon right there. It's a crazy product. If you guys don't have kids and you don't know what Hatchimals is, I don't know, go on YouTube, watch some kids playing with it or something, because it's just, it's a crazy different kind of product. I've never yeah. seen anything like it. Okay, cool. so we got we got some great questions here. Um, we always have a really smart audience, Dave. Um, let's see, let me get going here. Okay, this is a really smart question from Renee. Has your targeting to boys or girls changed now that stores like Target no longer separate toys by gender? See, I didn't even know that. That's interesting. Well, Target still separates toys by gender, and. Uh... There is a gender role in, in everything. And I, I know that um, gender has been a hot topic for a long time, but I, I know what little girls like and I know what little boys like, and they are two different things. It doesn't matter what anybody says about it. They are two different things. And um, you can't, if you really want to hit the big middle of the market, where all the sales are. You have to have big middle of the market vision on where it's going. So if you try to make toys that are gonna be gender neutral, you're gonna limit the amount of sales that you're gonna get, just the way it is. You know, little boys tend, this is, there's, no, there's no absolute, but they tend to like toys that are of a different nature. They love Nerf. Girls love Nerf, but boys love Nerf more. Girls like dolls that they can play play act and role play with. Boys also will like that. They might like it in a different way. They, they'll take an action figure version of that, and a girl will take, uh, you know, maybe a fashion doll version of that. And the fashion dolls have changed dramatically over time, right? But if you want to hit the big part of the market, we design toys for girls, we design toys for boys, we design gender neutral toys at times, but I know where that toy is going to sell predominantly based on what we make. So we made, we've made, we've made um, projectile products for girls, right? And they will buy them. They just won't buy them at the same rate as boys. So if you have, a, if you have like, like um, Hasbro has the Nerf line. Inside of Nerf, they did Rebel. Rebel was targeted to girls. And that was a big segment because Nerf is a billion dollar brand. So they did a good, you know, $50 million targeted just to girls in Rebel. So, you know, that's how I view it. And I, I believe that is, well, it works. Hmm. Adam says, how important is a prototype? My creativity is off the charts, but my engineering engineering skills are lacking what's the best approach for this skill set thanks 
Well, if your creativity is off the chart, then you need to partner with somebody like happened with us. Paul's creativity is off the chart. He partners with me and my, my development capability is, is okay. So together we made a better team. You will have limited success with drawings. You will have limited success in any way that you try to exploit this idea. If you can't make a prototype to take to a show to sell to retailers to buy, to make a prototype to go to a manufacturing company for them to manufacture it or a prototype to license it to a third party. So, you, you know, for us, we've never sold off those pictures. There are inventors that were successful selling off of concept pictures. The days of doing that are over any respectable major toy company or even uh, second tier and third tier toy companies which are great companies to target by the way because those companies grow into second and third and first tier companies right so targeting some of these smaller companies that have less capability internal is a is a good place to go you you target mattel you better be damn good at what you do because they're damn good at what they do mm -hmm. Next one's from Hannah. Hi, Dave. Do you file intellectual property for all inventions that you will present to a company? If not, is there a process that you use to decide which of the hundred you would secure provisionals for? Thank you. Well, I go out of business. I wouldn't go out of business, but it's really, really difficult, time consuming, and expensive to try to protect every one of your ideas. Now, if you're a small guy with few things that you are want that you're trying to sell and you have your one big idea and you're hell bent on doing that one big idea and it's in a space that is not per se fashion then you might want to try to protect it with the provisional at least but with the provisional you have one year to exploit it before you have to pull the trigger or let it go. So I don't typically do many provisionals myself. I have done them in the past, but in, we have some, I don't know, I have some 42 patents or something like that. Of all those products, that's all we patented. So be, be you know, you want protection. And if you go to reliable companies, you will typically get their honor system of not knocking you off. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It does happen. It doesn't happen to us because they know if they do that to shoot the moon, then they'll end up with a bad relationship with shoot the moon, and that's not a good idea. <clears throat> so there's a good honor system back and forth. Toy companies have a bunch of ideas on their own. Well, they tell you, we already have this idea. I can tell you 99.9% .9 of the time, they already have that idea. And so to go back and say, oh, I showed it to you and you stole it from me, it's not gonna work. You can get all upset about it and you can sue and sometimes you can win. But in general, the toy companies are being fairly straight. The problem with showing things without protection, is most things are very difficult to protect in the first place, particularly for toys. So you show it and you try to wait for protection which is a long road to hoe and a toy company already has that idea or they didn't like it what happens is that idea that you gave them rubs off and it becomes part of people's general knowledge and it will make itself whether they and i don't think they do it purposefully but it just becomes part of general knowledge and so keeping it with inventor relations who has a much better chance at trying to make sure that everybody knows where this idea germinated is is the is a good way to go so I mean, it is a very hard thing to give exact detail on what you should or should not do i don't do many provisionals i trust the relationship uh, but if there's something that i think is protectable and has legs i will get a patent on it Okay. It. Next one's from Chad. Many thanks, Dave, for your insight. Would you say there's a better time of year than another to present toy ideas to a manufacturer or company? 
um, and should I consider the build up to the holiday season? So can you give uh, people a timeline? That's that's part my part addition to that. People don't have an idea of how long it takes to launch, I think. And um, what, what time of year is a good time? When's not a good time? Or is it always a good time? No, it's not always a good time. Toy companies are open for business at specific times of the year, particularly the majors. Uh, the major toy companies, you know, they open for business a couple of months for spring product and a couple of months for fall product. And if you get in too early, they'll forget about it. If you get in too late, you miss the window for the next coming year. Christmas has nothing to do with toy development. It's absolutely, toy development is done, gone, finished by the time Christmas rolls around, you know, that has nothing to do with it. We develop, toy companies are looking for right, right now. Right now, we are mid-year 20. A product that we show them right now would be for spring 22, right now. Right, which means that it will sell into retail in December. You know, retailers take their spring product in in December when every fourth quarter products are all being pushed out, and then they'll stock those shelves January, February, getting ready for spring sales because everything is, is advanced. So this is a good time to sell product. Then for fall product, they will be open for business again October through January for fall product 22. And that's when they're looking for things. That's what they want to see. Stephen, do you think he's shocking some people listening on how long it takes to launch a major toy there? No, I think I think David gives a realistic um, mm -hmm. perspective on all of it. I think what's really interesting you know, he like he said about protecting ideas, you know, there's a certain trust element, right? And if you see something you really love, you know, protect it. But there has to be a little bit of trust going on. And I think he's pretty realistic about the prototypes. I think at the end of the day, regardless of what you show someone, they, they want proof of concept. That makes perfect sense as well. I also okay. like what you said about finding the mid-sized companies, right? I mean, especially if you're starting out, those mid-sized companies are going to are looking for the next big hit, and uh, you know if you're at a you're playing with Hasbro, Mattel, you, you, that's big leagues, so you you better be really good at this. Yes. Um, and I do think he's realistic with how long it takes, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of work to be done. So you you have to plan ahead. The one thing I think he did say at the very beginning, which I did like, the toy industry historically, and I don't know if this is true or not, David, has gives somewhat of a small advance when they sign. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah talk a little bit about that, David, real quick. Well, a typical, <clears throat> you don't typically get an advance right off the bat. The, the way it works these days is that a toy company will bring a product in that they like, and if they like it and don't want you to show it to anybody else, they will give you an option. And that's an option to exclusively look at the product for a period of time. Typically, an option is for just a typical run-of-the-mill product is $5,000 a month for however long they want to look at. So they want to limit the amount of time they look at it. So they will typically bring you a $10,000 deal for two months. Now, that's just a typical everyday product. These numbers can range dramatically in smaller companies. They want to do a thousand dollars a month. Big ideas that I've spent, you know, uh, two man years, three man years of work on, and they're not getting that for five thousand dollars a month. <laughs> you know, not even close. <laughs> so they're sort of all over the map, but that's a good sort of idea for a general product, five thousand a month for an option. Then when the product if they decide they want to move forward with the product, you'll enter into a license agreement. And that agreement has ranges from $20,000 to $2 million for a license agreement. Do not think that you're going to get a $2 million license agreement advance. Those happen rarely. I've done few of them in my career, and we get the biggest advances in the industry. So 
you would be really good if you came out with a license agreement that's somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 50k that would be really good but that number is based on expected wholesale sales it's based on 25 percent of a low ball projection of wholesale sales for that company for that year okay so that if they project that the company is going to do x and that's going to spin off let's say a hundred thousand in royalty they're going to offer you twenty five thousand dollars of advance that's the general rule of thumb okay what, and is if, there you, such... if they for those of the people that are new if if you if you sell more you're going to make more than that but that's an advance on royalties oh yeah it's just an advance against royalties so okay. Uh, David, Before one last question. Going, guys, everybody's dying to hear. Last question. I just want to ask everybody if you can type your thank yous for Dave in the questions box. Um, that would be great, and I can send those to him later. Uh, so please do that. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, one last question, David. Um, is there such thing as a standard royalty rate? What's the highest you've ever seen, and what's the lowest? Well, uh, I'm not going to give you high and low because those numbers vary so dramatically. But you want to target 5% for a product, a standard product idea that does not have an overlay of a third party license like an Elmo. The toy company has to pay Sesame Street some exorbitant royalty rate on that product. And so that royalty rate they will want you to go down to 3% for that royalty rate. So five and three is a typical where you start off. I will have to tell everybody, getting a 5% royalty deal today is difficult because there's compression in price points, there's compression, and there's expansion in cost of goods. So the toy companies are squeezed in the middle. But those are the general rules of thumb. It is not out of it is not out of ordinary for a toy company to offer a one percent deal, hmm. and it is not unreasonable to accept a one percent deal in some cases. And you know, as far as how high they go is a there's a lot of factors determining how yeah. high it goes. How yeah, because high goes. go ahead. Because David, some people complain to me. They they look at the portal over at one of the big players, I'm not going to name it, and they come back and they go, oh, the royalty rate's too too low. Um, and it's about that range that you talked about, about 1.5. And But they have great distribution. They're worldwide. And I, I think they're going inside the amateur portal, not the, they're not yeah, dealing with the- Yeah, they're going in the amateur portal. And um, obviously toy companies, any company, I'm not going to say toy companies, they're running a business. They want to pay you as little as they can possibly pay you. And you have to you have to have credibility and et cetera in order to get that rate up. You're not going to get that rate up just because, just because, right? And you know, you, you want to build up a portfolio of products and get some revenue coming in. And once you get revenue coming in, then you can make more products and you can become more successful. So if it's your first deal, and you got to take a one and a half percent deal, take it. Okay. How many deals have you walked away from? No, oh, I've walked away from uh, my fair share of deals, uh, but uh, you know we're a different animal. I mean, we are we're shoot the moon, so we can afford to walk away from deals to make a point. And toy companies have walked away from deals with me to make a point. And that's when I said I have some regrets or were times when I negotiated too hard. They walked away from the deal. You know, you never want to get there. So don't get there. Do they don't, ever don't. come back after you walk away? Sure. Sure, but rare. I mean, you are taking a big guts move because it pisses everybody off. And I wouldn't do it unless I were one of the majors that, you know, they they still need to work with. You you want to make the deal. You got to, I mean, they have valid issues to deal with. You got to listen to them. And you know, I, you know, it's hard sometimes to understand the business implications of all these deals, but um, try to get as, as much as you can. But if you really need that deal, you don't want to walk away. You'll regret it the rest of your life. 
Dave, Stephen talks about this all the time. People get way too obsessed about the royalty rate, but it's really the royalty rate and the volume that they can sell. And of course, the price point as well. So yeah, yeah in consumer products, 5% is pretty common. We found that our students do with companies. But if, if it's a toy company and they're giving you 2% and they're doing massive, massive volume, you just got to run the numbers and it's, it's a different, different animal. Well, you may have to accept deals like that in the beginning. You just may. I don't know. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, there's a bunch of thank yous here. We don't have time to read them all. I'll just read a quick few. Uh, John says, thanks, Dave. Great information. Um, John, uh, this is another John. Diff two Johns here. Uh, great knowledge share, Dave. Really appreciate it. Uh, Jen says, thank you so much for your time and knowledge. You've been very informative. Uh, Pablo says, thanks so much in all capitals. I got so much information that I really wanted to hear. Um, just a, there's just a, too many thank yous to read, but I'll, I'll send them off to you, Dave. So uh, I, 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 I hope that, uh, I hope some people learn from it. And, um, well, you scared everybody, David, you scared everybody from the industry tonight. Why? Why, why do you say that? <laughs> I don't think, you don't think you did that. I think it was great. Listen, I I, I'm just trying to be, you know me, Steve, I'm, a, I'm quite the realist on how to, yes. how I see the world and how the world works. And I, I like that you are, okay? And that's why it was so important for me to have you on tonight, Dave, because you do, you give the real deal and it's important for people to hear it. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on tonight. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dave. I want to remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.